Hello and you're very welcome to another edition of the JMOC podcast. I'm John Mann and of course this podcast is sponsored by orgoretro.com and the tax board. Use my promo code JMOC podcast to get 15% off on orgoretro.com and get the best skins, gloves and equipment on attack.ie. Be attack minded. And today I'm joined by Roscommon senior footballer uh, Donny Smith to talk about his career, the COVID situation and everything that goes with the GA topics at the minute. So lots to discuss and lots to look forward to today. So uh, Donny, how are you keeping? All good, John. Thanks for having me on. Uh, just back from our first day back at school today, so I can't complain. It's great to be back, and thanks very much for having me on. No problem. No problem. Uh, too warm for you out there? No, perfect. You can never complain. You can never complain about the heat in Ireland because we don't get enough of it. Even during the heat wave a couple of weeks ago, it was just lovely. So no, all for the heat. Yeah, Jesus, yeah, yeah. I was just saying to you off air, I normally do these podcasts when it's pissing rain, so it's a pity the sun's absolutely splitting the stone, Stony. so yeah. <laughs> we'll be nice and quick. <laughs> no, don't worry, it's no bother. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, no problem. So, so Stony, we can, we can start off, um, obviously we can, we can touch on uh, this season for the Roscommon uh, senior footballers, obviously the league uh, flash by and the uh, championship as well, so uh, like ourselves here in Cavan, it, it was short and sweet unfortunately, but uh, we, we could touch on it anyway, Tony, uh, I suppose when, when you look back on it uh, this year, I suppose obviously the big thing might come in with is maybe frustration, obviously maybe getting relegated at the uh, first round knockout in, against uh, Galway, but you know, as you were saying off air, to be a shortened season, next year you can build on a lot more, but what would be your overriding emotions on uh, this year's uh, Ross Common season, Tony? Yeah, I suppose, uh, John, like there, it, it's no secret, like it's a huge disappointment. I think we played three games in the league, we played a, a playoff, we played Galway, and history will say we lost the five of the games, and that's the reality of the situation. You know, we went in... Um, like every team would look with bit expectations, we were hoping to stay up. Um, obviously, obviously we were in the same group as Dublin, Kerry, and Galway. Now, no easy games, but we felt we might have had enough to stay up. And then we got to the playoff against our man. We just didn't perform, and that was probably it's, it's nearly as disappointing as the championship loss to Galway. To be honest with you, we went up there full of confidence, backing ourselves. We played them, our man many times before. We we always had to measure them, and we just didn't perform. Like we got off to a flyer. We were five one up at the first water break and then they just kicked into gear and in fairness to them they took their chances like they're a great team and obviously you can see McGinney has done wonders with them the improvement they have over the last couple of years and Donaghy and Kieran McKeever in as well so they've definitely improved from that point of view but just looking at our at ourselves and you know assessing the match the week after we were just you know we, we were so poor and there's there's no other there's no other way to talk about it because we were poor you know there's no point buttering up saying this that and the other we were just really really poor and then, you know, it's it's funny, like after a, a relegation or a poor league campaign, you know, you're always looking, okay, championship, you know, we you park the league all together. But I suppose coming into the championship, we knew it was knockout, we knew it was Galway. And again, just one of those things where we just didn't perform. And, you know, you can talk about t- tactics. And I know a lot of people maybe were uh, criticised our tactics, the way we played or whatever. But at the end of the day, you know, we're on the pitch, the 15 of us were on the pitch when we didn't perform and you can have any tactics you want but if the boys on the pitch don't perform there can be no point of fingers to anybody else but the players so I think as players we have to take a fair share of blame and criticism because you know the, the lads on the sideline can only do or can only do as well as what we do on the pitch ourselves so yeah to summarise just huge disappointment Like I, I, I can't uh, I can't make a secret of it because you know Five games, five losses, it tells its own story. Yeah, 100%, only 100%. And obviously, that game uh, a few weeks ago against Galway in the Connacht Championship, uh, we obviously, was, it was in poor weather conditions. Everything kind of nearly kind of went against us that day. He's played some okay football. He's probably had a couple of chances to win the game. I know Galway probably were in good enough form during the Connacht Championship, Tony, and maybe not bad form in the Connacht final as well. But what uh, kind of areas did you look at in that game? You know, because when you, maybe when you're analysing the game after, what did maybe the management team say after that game? Because at the end of the day, Tony, I know maybe it was disappointment, but you did run them close. Yeah, we did. I suppose after the game, you know, it, it, there was very, I won't lie to you, John, there was very little talk after the game. You know, it's after every championship game, you know, you, you have a chat with a, with a few of the lads. There's a huge post mortem, but from the management point of view, I think the overriding uh, emotion was just disappointment. I, I felt, and I'm sure the management felt as well, we had our homework done, we were ready to go. And just the way things happened, I know on the face of it, it was a six-point loss. I think it was five or six-point loss, but it wasn't. 
it wasn't that. It was, you know, it was a lot tighter than that. They got a goal probably near the end that put a bit of gloss on it. And, you know, Galway played as probably a similar brand to us where, you know, they probably flooded the back. But the difference is they won. So who gets the criticism? The team that loses. So, you know, from that point of view, it was disappointing. And I suppose not being able to, or not being able to, but just not playing to a level which we're so capable of. It's probably a, a key criticism of the Roscommon team at the minute that we're just probably not consistent enough. You know, we could go out, we can perform with the best, we can play to the play with the best, and then the next week we could be really, really underperforming. I suppose if you're a Roscommon supporter or someone who follows us, I'd say you could be tearing your hair out look, think, looking at us because from one week to the next, we're just probably not consistent enough at the moment and that is a huge issue and something that we really need to rectify going forward as a group yeah 100 only 100 and i suppose obviously the current uh, management team that's there at the minute uh, anthony cunningham and stevie poachers obviously and you were saying to me off air stevie didn't have a whole pile of time to work which is it was only a couple of weeks with this COVID situation uh donny suppose so i suppose a bit of air of optimism towards uh, next year donny because at the end of the day you might have a full uh, calendar fixtures there'll be more time to work on various bits and pieces that you did want to work on so i know this year really was heartbreak but you know next year could be a lot more positive donny Oh yeah, of course, and it's a great thing about Gaelic football. You know, it's you've always next year. I know players and managements might change, but if you want to be there, you'll be there next year. And of course, look at we really haven't had a season, a proper season, like every other county in two years. So hopefully, with the numbers staying low and a lot of people get the vaccine and are protected, we can have a proper season next year. And all we want is is just games. You know, we we trained a lot throughout the lockdown by ourselves and in small pods, but. Next year, hopefully, we can get our pre-season league going, or there, apparently there could be um, a change to the structure of the championship in the league. If if there is, I'm all for it. We just want games, and we just want to, you know, play a consistent number of games to show how good we can be, and hopefully we can p- be competing again. Because you know, we 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 don't turn a bad team overnight. You know, on the face of it, 2020 we lost to Mayo in the championship, and 2021 we lost to Galway. By any by anyone's measurement, they're they're both very good sides, and just because you lose to them doesn't mean we're a bad side. So I'm just hoping, as a player, and I'm hoping the rest of the lads as well, we rectify that this time next year because you know it, it is going to be a long winter. While we have club championship now kicking off in the next few days, it's a long winter until we get back to December and January, and there could be a lot of change uh, yet. Yeah, definitely, Tony, definitely. Well, it'll be a long winter, but obviously lots to work on and probably an exciting project for next year ahead. But I suppose, Tony, the current set of affairs there, obviously this weekend you've uh, Kerry against Tyrone in the All-Ireland semi-final and last weekend you had Dublin against Mayo and Mayo finally, finally coming out on top against the Dubs. What was the verdict in that game, Tony? And uh, geez, it meant a lot to the Mayo footballers. Oh, it did. Look, at, um, I'm lucky enough, I know a lot of the Mayo lads and through colleges and obviously playing them as well. I, I can't say anything, but I was just delighted for them. You know, there's a lot of good guys on that Mayo team who, look, at they, they know themselves. They haven't won the All-Ireland. It's there, there for them in a couple of weeks. But I was absolutely delighted for them. I think, you know, um, if there was ever one team to beat Dublin, as great have, as Dublin have been and as unbelievable ambassadors for our sport they've been, Mayo are probably the team that probably deserved it after all the heretics they've gone through playing Dublin. And I suppose the optimistic thing for Mayo going in in a couple of weeks is that they, they know they probably didn't play that well. Like if you look at the game back, I looked at, back, looked at it back on the Sunday morning again just to see what it was like with, with knowing the result. And they didn't really play well till maybe the six, 60th minute mm. being realistic. They were still losing at that stage. And then you had the likes of Conroy and O'Donoghue and Cohn kicking a couple of points. But I'm sure James Horn is delighted that they'll have loads to work on because from their point of view, it was far from the finished article of a performance, which I'm sure is great for them because they've loads to build on coming up in the next couple of weeks. 100% Donny. What was the verdict on the uh, Dublin performance? Obviously, obviously Mayo finally getting over the line against them as well, Donny. So it was it was great stuff for Mayo. But what next for Dublin? I know, OK, a lot of people are nearly saying, oh, panic stations, get rid of Desi Farr, blah, blah, blah. Nonsense, really, Donny, when you think about it, because he has won an All Ireland with this team. But um, what next for the Dublin footballers? Maybe a few uh, retirements or a few lads coming back? Yeah, look, at, at the end of every year, I'm sure there's guys in that dressing room who have seven, eight All Ireland medals that maybe are reassessing things. But on the flip side, I 100% agree with you. There's absolutely no need for panic stations from Dublin's point of view. Okay, maybe people were saying they were flat this year and 
this, that, and the other in Leinster, the kind of, you know, the labour through it, but the silver beating teams by seven, eight, nine points. And even in the first half against Mayo, like they kicked 10 points and they were on it. You know, at one stage, I think Kilkenny got a point. He had the ball for nearly, they had the ball for nearly two minutes. It was vintage Dublin. And you feel in the second half, at the start of the second half, if Dublin were just able to chip on maybe two or three points, that could have been curtains for Mayo. So, no, look, I don't think there's going to be need for an absolute overhaul or, you know, if, if you're calling for Desi Farrell's head, you know, you'd really have to reassess whether you know anything about football or not because, you know, he's done a great job. It's not easy taking over from someone like Jim Gavin. So, no, I think with Dublin, look, at, I'm sure there'll be guys there who will be thinking of... Um, retirements but I'm sure as well there'll be guys there who have the one whatever they've won they'll be thinking okay let's rewind the clock back to zero take the winter to rest up and come back fresh like I don't think even at this stage anybody really be betting against Dublin to be back in another and a final again next year you know and that's the reality of it like they lost but you know winning and losing there's a fine line yeah, yeah, hundred percent, Tony. And obviously, this weekend you've uh, carry against Tyrone. The game's finally go ahead, going ahead. We were talking off air about the COVID situation in Tyrone and everything that went went with that. But um, looking ahead to that game, Tony, what what would be the verdict on it? Because we know Kerry very favoured this year. Tyrone the last couple of weeks can have gone into hiding, so it's, it's an intriguing game, Tony. It is, yes. Yeah. It's, it's kind of hard to know where um, we're both. Well, I suppose firstly, obviously, Tyrone had the COVID situation, so it's hard to know how training has gone for them in the last couple of weeks. You know, I'm, I'm sure it was very disjointed. I'm sure there's a good few Zoom calls talking about game plans and stuff like that. So it's hard to know where Tyrone are at. As well as that, I think Kerry, you know, they've, they've gone through Munster. They have went through the league, maybe apart from the Dublin game, fairly comfortably. So this will probably be their first biggest test. And from the outside looking in, people were probably saying they can't see anything but a Kerry win which is unfortunate for Kerry because they're probably in a lose situation because if they beat Tyrone by seven, eight, nine points, people say, well, Tyrone were disjointed. And if they only beat Tyrone by a couple of points, people might be questioning them. And obviously if they lose, it could spell, you know, it could spell the end of a lot of people in the in the, in, in the Kerry uh, team and back from him, you don't know. So yeah, I, I, I really don't know at the minute. I My inkling at the moment is just maybe because Kerry just have more firepower. I think the way their forwards play, they just play a brand that's just, it's so good to watch. It's just the man in the best position always gets the ball. There's no such thing as a pot shot. They score many of their scores right outside the D or inside the D. And I just think they'll have too much for Tyrone. Now, having said that, people always say, well, Kerry's forwards are excellent and there's question marks over their defence. Tyrone are going to have to go after Kerry. You know, they're going to have to go out and play and kick the ball in and ask questions of the Kerry backline, especially with the likes of Matty Donnelly and Conor McKenna inside. So if, if I was from Tyrone or if I was involved in Tyrone, I think you'd have to be looking at going after their defence and look at if, if they're if they're able to get a bit of change off them in the first half, you never know what, what could happen. You know, Tyrone might get their gander up and Kerry might, you know, retreat into a panic station. So it, it is going to be interesting, but I just feel as well with the Kerry bench, while Tyrone do have a good bench too, I just feel Kerry will just have enough to get over the line. Um, but I do think it will be close. I We were chatting as well off air that maybe Tyrone, you, you've an inkling for Tyrone. Uh, you obviously are closer to Tyrone than I am. You might know more what's going on. But yeah, it, it will be a lot closer than people think. Like I don't think it's going to be formality where Kerry will win pulling up or anything like that. I think it's going to be tight and it probably will go down to the wire. Yeah, yeah, a game we're really, really looking forward to. And I was listening to Enda McGinley and off the ball there this morning, Tony, and he was kind of saying that, I think it was Jerry Gilroy was making the point that Colin McShane's only been making kind of cameo appearances. Darren McCurry is having an excellent season, but, you know, he can be curtailed, I suppose, if the right man is put on him. So, I suppose, Tony, if Tyrone were to kind of look look ahead and go at this game with the likes of Colin McShane, he'd be starting. Colin McKenna would really need a big performance because he's had a, you know, a quiet enough season so far. So, the big men for Tyrone really need to step up this weekend, don't he? Yeah, uh, the like for for Paul McShane uh, or for Colin McShane, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> for for Colin McShane, I'm I'm not sure. Do you start him? He came look. He came on against um, Monaghan. He he did kick his point. He did look rusty. I have to say that he did look very rusty. And I suppose the only way to get the rust out is to play. So it it really will depend how he trained during the last couple of weeks. I'm sure they played a couple of in-house games or AVBs. But 
it's it is a it is a risk I think if you do start him I really think that I think even when he did did come on uh, against Mon he did he got his point and in fairness his point was it was crucial part of the game but he just wasn't himself and that's totally understandable you know he he's been out since before covid so he's been out since February 2020 essentially and we came on in a couple of games in Ulster but this is going to be a different different case altogether different story with Kerry playing at Co Park as well I'd hold him for two reasons. For the first reason is when when he does come on, he obviously is a quality player. He can score. But if the game is in the melting plot with 10, 15 minutes to go, the boost he'll bring. You, there's no, I have no doubt if he does come on and the game is tight, the Tyrone supporters will get huge energy off that and the players will as well. So um, I would probably hold him. Yeah, 100%, Tony, 100%. It'll be an absolute intriguing battle and one we're really looking forward to this Saturday. So I suppose we'll uh, touch on to your own career, Tony. Obviously, you've uh, represented uh, Roscommon from uh, 2012 to the present day. You made your championship debut against Throne in 2012 and your league debut against Sligo in 2013. So 2012, Tony, it was a very exciting year for yourself, no doubt. And um, I suppose, Tony, the first question I can ask you is, is this something you always wanted to do, represent the Roscommon senior footballers? Yeah, hundred percent. I think it was always it was always in, in my head that I I I was planning to always play uh, football with Roscommon at, at some at some stage. You know, if I was when I was thirteen, fourteen, the aim the aim was to be a county minor. You know, and when I got to minor, the aim was to be an under twenty one. And when I got to obviously under twenty one, I was lucky enough to be brought into the seniors. So yeah, I I I have no problem admitting it. Like it was always the, it was always the aim to be a, a Roscommon senior. Like I used to go to all the games. I remember when Roscommon uh, played Kerry in the quarterfinal in 2003 and I think I was 10 at the time. I was like envious of the players going out playing at Crow Park. You know, like obviously I was supporting them. I was mad from Sue well, but I was like, oh, I'd love to be there. You know, and even when the lads won the kind of title in 2010, I was just playing minor and just going into the game, just the buzz. It was just unbelievable. I was like, mm. you know, I was like, I'd love to be a part of that and just, you know, to see the outpouring of emotion that day and just to be a part of one of those big days would just be, you know, something that I would could work towards, work, work towards. And I was lucky in 2012 after uh, the under 21 campaign, uh, Des Newton brought me in and I uh, was training with the lads for a couple of months. And then I did come on for the last few minutes of the Tyrone game in, albeit we lost, but personally I was delighted, you know, I was, I think I came on Mark and uh, Ricey McManaman, I think. so. Lovely. Yeah, he had a lovely welcome for me. I'd say, <laughs> I'd, say, I'd say when I came on, I'd say he was looking at me thinking, who is this? I was about 72 or 73 kg. I'd say he was licking his lips when, I, when he saw me coming onto the pitch. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I think from an, early, from an early age, John, it was, yeah, very much get to the, get to the senior stages. 100%. I suppose, obviously, making your debut against uh, Tyrone in the Championship and obviously coming up against the great uh, Ryan McMahon and Doney, kind of basically thrown into the deep end. How, how did you find all that? Because, obviously, you were playing minor in previous years before that. Obviously, you did tag on an under-21 kind of title as well. But, you know, Doney, that's that's no mean feat to make your debut against a very, very fancy Tyrone team back in 2012, Doney. Yeah, I think as well at the time when I did come on, it, I think being realistic about it and looking back at it, I think we were seven or eight down. So the game was, you know, nearly over in a sense. So my plan was just, on, just get my hands in the ball and just don't do anything crazy, you know, just get it, <laughs> shift it off. I think I got one ball in it and I passed it off to whoever I passed it off, but I was happy enough. I was just trying to run away from Ricey in case I got a clip off the back of my head off him. So I was uh, happy enough. I didn't get any clips that day, but... Uh, yeah, when I came on, I was just, don't do anything mad. You don't have to do anything crazy here. The game is essentially over. So just, if you get the ball, pass it off and just get back to your position and keep it simple. Well, I think, Bryce, you retired after a couple of games after that, don't you? So you must have retired with whatever you've done. <laughs> well, I, well, I, think, uh, Gucci, I think it was Gucci retired in the following week, so I'm not going to be claiming anything like that at all. <laughs> Brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff, Tony. And yeah, so the, the following year after that, in, in 2013, you, you probably had a full crack of it. Uh, you made your debut in the league against uh, Sligo um, in 2013. So, Tony, you got a full crack of it then, and obviously you made a big impression in uh, 2012 training and various bits like that. So what was it like to fully break on in 2013, Tony? 
Uh, yeah, it was great. We were just under our new management. John Evans had just came in, I think it was in winter 2012. So, yeah, um, I, I was kind of in from the start as obviously I still had the under 21s to prepare for as well at that stage. And obviously that was my priority as, as it should have been. And it was, but yeah, I, I, I was, you know, I was lucky enough that I was always training. And I suppose when you're young coming in, the big thing, and it's one of probably the most important thing for any young guy coming in, because you can see it with a lot of young guys coming in senior squads, you know, they could break down with injury or whatever not. I, I was lucky to stay fit and stay off the physio table. You know, I was always available for training. I was always available for selection and coming in and just getting a good three, four months of training under my belt to show what the management I could do was um, so beneficial because, you know, you know yourself when you're going back to winter training, there could be guys standing at the side of the pitch, maybe not fancying it or maybe being injured, but I was just oh, licking my lips. I was loving it, every bit of it. And yeah, I, I make no bones about it as well. When I went to training, I, 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 I was fully, you know, I, I was... I was like, this is where exactly where I should be. Like, I, I, I wasn't here just to make up the numbers or be the young fella coming in to make a small impression. I, I wanted to be playing. And yeah, I was lucky enough that John and the management team gave me a chance during the league. And um, oh, I loved it. It was games. I wasn't used to it as well because when you're with the under-21s and with the minors, you just have championship games. With the senior, we had games every week, February, March and April with the league. And then we were rolling into championships. So oh, I was loving it, you know, absolutely loving it. Yeah, brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. And obviously, touching on some of those common players, even back in 2013 there, Donny, you had the likes of Shawnee McDermott, uh, Cottle Craig, and flying flying high and doing really well. And obviously, your, your brother Enda as well, playing for his common. So what was it like to kind of play with some of them players as well? Because obviously, Cottle's still trucking along, obviously keeping fit and tight, kind of keeping involved with those common footballers. But what was it like to play with them gents over the years, uh, Donny? Oh, it was great. Like Especially for someone like Cottle. Cottle went to DCU. Um, he was in DC at the time, and he he was um, probably a big reason why I went to DC as well. I always looked up to him. He's only he's only five minutes down the road from his mum and dad, or just five minutes down the road from us in uh, French Park. So, yeah, just it, it was surreal because two or three years earlier, I saw Carl having started against uh, Sligo in the kind of final, and he went on to have an All Star nomination as well in 2010. So yeah, it was a bit surreal at the time, and obviously Shawnee. You know, he's he's an absolute legend for us, Scum. I think he's put in 16 years, Scum, and by the time he finished up in 2018. So, you know, it was great to be um to be in training with the guys that I would have looked up at looked up to when I was a youngster. And a lot of trains where we did have the games, I was marking Shawnee, so it was great. And you know, he was the ultimate, you know, if it doesn't matter if it was a challenge match in January or championship game in Crow Park, you know, he was always on it. So you know, we're always in for a tough one, which was great because if I didn't put myself against him, I wouldn't be benefiting him or the team, you know. So um, it was great as well. And there was a lot of guys, probably um, guys that probably aren't as well known around the country that we were, that I was in there training with that I just had so much respect for and I looked up to them and it was just a great experience for me. And, you know, they were they were unbelievable with me. Like, they were the most supportive ever. And not, not that, any, that they wouldn't have been, but they were just great. You know, they were fully... They fully back me. They always, you know, th there was no such thing as oh, you have to uh, apply your trade here, and you you have to follow a certain set of rules. They were they fully back me, and you know, it's something that hopefully that I try to do to the younger guys that come onto our panel now, because obviously I'm one of the elder men too as well. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Only suppose looking uh, looking at what's common ball over the years. Obviously in the college championship, he is he obviously as you referenced in off air, uh, Galway and Mayo. So that's no kind of easy kid to feed to kind of come up against them gents, uh, Donny. So suppose it's it's a competitive championship, and then obviously use in, in what's common would have been Division One and Two throughout the years as well. So what's it like to kind of play in Division One and Two over the years, and obviously three at, at part time as well, because obviously Cavan would have been in the same division with you a lot of the years as well. So to kind of play them kind of top tier teams, Donny you're really testing yourself against the best yeah 100 percent. and as we were just talking off air when you're when we were just talking about say getting relegated to division two or playing in division one or getting promoted in division two you know you want to be playing the division one teams every day of the week like I'd, I'd rather play dublin every single week than play a division four team now that i don't want to disrespect the division four team either because i we, we were in division four not too long ago but the only way you get better you know is you you play in Division One against the best teams, and I don't think it's a coincidence that we won our both kind of titles. We were actually relegated by playing in Division One, and I, I suppose as well, we we've been in Division Two where, not that we sleepwalked through Division Two, but we've won Division Two, 
you know, without having to overextend ourselves and maybe psychologically in the back of our head, it probably didn't help coming up to play big games against the bigger teams in championship. Now, I'm not saying it was a reason, but there could be something in the back of our minds thinking that maybe we didn't get the best prep for playing in the championship, you know. And in Division 1, while we were probably, you know, we were taking some decent enough um, hammerings against the bigger teams, especially, I think, we played Dublin one year in Crow Park and oh, what we I think we conceded something like 425, like a cricket score. But, you know, like how else are you going to learn? Like you're not going to learn by playing a Division 4 team and beating them by 30 points. You might pat yourself in the back and think you're an all-star, which is far from the reality of the situation. You know, playing the likes of Dublin, Kerry, Donegal, Tyrone, uh, Mayo, like it's, it's the only way you get better. And the more that and the more exposure to that, especially at a younger age, the better you'll be for when you reach your prime and reach your peak and you'll be ready to go against the likes of them fellas in the bigger days in August and September, hopefully. And interesting to hear your perspective on that as well, Donny. Obviously, the um, the beat the Dublin gave you in Croke Park, like every other team, it's really suffered in recent years, unfortunately. But Donny, um, interesting. Like, obviously, you, you sounded like you weren't overly kind of dismayed or dis- disappointed by that kind of game. But obviously, like a big scoreline. But you know, what kind of lear- I know you were kind of touching on it there. But what kind of learnings maybe did you take from that game? Because obviously, the high the scoreline was pretty huge. But what kind of learnings did you take from that game if you weren't if that's the level you want to be at? Well, I think the first thing is, I think it's the speed at which the game is played. I really think, like, playing at Division 1, Division 2, if you were to watch them maybe one after another, I think, the, and definitely playing them as I have, the speed in which the game is played. You don't get a second when you're playing in the full forward line against the likes of uh, Mick Fitzsimons or uh, Ty Moore. They're all over you. Division 2, maybe it might be a second or two behind. Now, I'm not saying that Division 2 defenders are whichever uh, division they might be in or slower or anything like that. It's just that you have an extra second when you're in Division 2, from my point of view, and as a forward, and as a forward that relies on speed and pace. You know, I think that's the biggest thing I've taken from it. You know, there's no team that trains harder than a Division 4 team or a Division 3 team or a Division 2 team. But I just think in Division 1, the speed of the game is a lot quicker. I don't know if that's to do with the better pitches or what it is, it's probably to do with a combination of things, maybe a small bit better skills, or just maybe thinking about the game a bit quicker. But I think if, if, if you were to look at any of the games, and especially the games I've played in, I've always thought, okay, when you're playing Division 1, you get that ball, but you have to move it, or you have to move with it. Division 2, maybe you might get away with taking a couple of plays, but Division 1, I think the speed is just, it's different level. While it mightn't look different level on TV, playing it is total different ball game altogether. Completely, completely, Donny. And I suppose, obviously, I was making the notes before this, you've obviously tagged on two National League titles. And unfortunately, you had our numbers both day in 2014 and 2018, Donny. So 2014, a close game. 2018, a close game against ourselves. I don't know what it is about you, but uh, 2014, Donny, a tight game. Went right down to the wire. But uh, a, lovely day for Croke, uh, a lovely day for us common in Croke Park. Yeah, I think uh, it was was it four sixteen to four four. It was a crazy ah, scoreline. Yeah, look, it was a it was a day like it was a day uh, for the forwards. I think maybe you got that, maybe three, you were I think you were three one to ten points up at some stage. I think you got a penalty and a couple of quick fire goals. But um, yeah, I don't know what it is about playing Cavan, and I have relations in Cavan. I know a lot of the Cavan players. I played actually a bit of soccer with Jason McLaughlin back when we were younger, so I know a lot of the lads. So. Um, yeah, it's funny how it works out. You know, we at the minute we we might be just their bogey team now. They have beaten us um, a couple of, a couple of times, but I suppose in and the bigger days and maybe the most important days we've just gotten over the line. But um, oh yeah, just huge respect for the the Cav and lads. And obviously when they won it last year, you know I was delighted for them because you know you even for the guys that have been soldiering for years, the likes of Gerard McCairn and Galligan and even Martin Riley, like them guys, you know you'd have huge respect for them guys because they were there when. Times weren't as nice for Cavan football. Like a lot of our older lads were coming too. They probably know what it's like what, to be, you know, maybe losing the first round of the championship and maybe get one more game, you know. So they were the guys I was looking at and thinking of when he won that title there last year in uh, November. 100%. Obviously, to win that uh, league title in 2014, Donny, and you made your full kind of proper start for us coming uh, the year before. So how special for feeling was it to win it in 2014, Donny? Because... Uh, <laughs> To win it, to win a league title, basically in your second uh, debut year, was common. It's good going. Yeah, it was. It was a big thing. I think um, 
it, it was when I suppose we realised, look, we need to be getting out of Division 3 to push on for championship. And it was funny, actually, the week of that game, we were all under 21 and we actually weren't allowed playing it because we had the All-Ireland final the week after against Dublin. So uh, we were watching on and like every supporter, we were very nervous. I think Cavan, they had the better of us. And I think um, for large parts of that game, I think um, Martin Dunn, I think maybe, had a penalty. I think it was saved. I missed this, yeah. I think so, yeah. And then I think we might have got a goal, David Keane in our wing back. Oh, he tells me he went for the top corner. Yeah. But he, he lobbed it over. He, he was going for a point, 100%. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Oh, he, he'll never admit it, but we all, I've seen him kick the ball before. He was definitely going for a point. He just dropped it short. Oh, if that doesn't go in, it's a different game. And yeah. to be honest with you, it was a kind of a smash and grab by us because Calvin were definitely better than us that day. I've no doubt about it. Watching on, you even felt that, you know, the more Calvin got into the game, the more Calvin attacked. You had a couple of suspect wides, it, you know, it kind of made Calvin and the team probably a bit nervous and it kind of gave us the, uh, a bit of a, I suppose, he, he took our foot off the throat and when we got that goal, how for sure truth as it was, we took it and we kind of went on from there. But yeah, Calvin was definitely one I'd say that they left behind them. And secondly, in 2018 as well, only a couple of years ago, Tony, uh, another mad game. I don't know what it is we're playing with Calvin Croker. Goals galore. Any, anything could happen. Another tight game and uh, another good day for Rose Common against Calvin, don't he? Uh, yeah, look, it was. I, I won't lie, but I don't know what it is. When we play each other, we just seem to just forget about defending. We just have no interest <laughs> yeah. in where we're set up. We just like, we like each other too much, don't we? <laughs> yeah, I think we've too, we've too much respect for each other. Uh, <laughs> definitely. Um, yeah, just the way it goes, I think. Again, he had an unbelievable start like he did in 2014. He got the penalty. He got a goal, I think, straight off the bat. He were two, I think he were two goals up to no score. And we just slowly but surely crawled back into it. But again, like we were, we, we were never, it was never a situation where we were beating you by seven or eight or nine points. You were always within arm's length. Now, I know we got to maybe five points. We got a th our third or fourth goal. And then you got a goal right after that. But we were lucky enough to hold on. But again, like if, if, if you're a defensive coach, it's, you know, you don't look at that game to, to improve your, to improve your team because it was just, it was carnage. It was just all out attack. Goals going in from everywhere. I think our corner back went up and got a goal that day. I'm nearly sure he did, yeah. So, uh, yeah. But look, at, we were lucky enough to be on the right side of the result and we got the trophy, which is obviously the most important thing at the time. Uh, well, you see Shawnee Johnson uh, running back to the quarterback line. You, yeah, you know, you know, Cavan's in trouble. Uh, Donny, you, you could, you could definitely say that much. Anyway, there's a great picture of you and him in sports. I think you're pulling back the jersey, so there's a bit of bad. No, 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 that wouldn't be me. No, 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 that wasn't me. Because number, number one, I don't foul, and number two, I don't tackle. So I don't know who it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to look again. I, I was looking at it, roasted the glasses. I, I look again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, good stuff, Dodie. Good stuff. And I suppose we could touch on to uh, 2017. We were talking about it off air. A magical, magical year for the Roscommon senior footballers. You got your hands on that elusive kind of title that, were, that basically Galway and Mayo have been dictated in the last couple of years, Dodie. There's no doubt about it. And um, Kevin McStay was in charge. It was just a mighty, mighty year for the. I know, obviously, maybe in the All Ireland series, it just came up short. But to win a Connacht title in 2017, Donny, a special, special feeling. Oh yeah, it was. I think it was probably the watershed moment for the team to win it. You know, if you remember, we kind of had there was a lot of discontent the year before. We had the breakup of management teams. A lot of players didn't commit, and you know, so Kevin was really, I suppose, trying to mould a brand new team together. There was, there was no. You know, th there's no doubt about it. Like the, a lot of lads that were playing and the, a lot of lads that were on the pitch in the kind of final, you know, I, I don't think there was many of them over 27, 28, maybe the, the exception of one lad. But like, it was total and utter relief, you know. And just the, the way the game went, we were lucky enough, we had a big enough cushion by the time the final whistle went. So two or three minutes to go, you knew, look at the game is going to be won. And just... Before the whistle, I don't know what it is about Roscommon supporters, but they just love a good old pitch invasion. Like they were standing on the sideline. It was um, on the far side where the stadium is in Pear Stadium. They were all lined up in front of all the Galway players and management and then underneath were the television cameras. So they were just literally standing on the sideline as if it was a club match. Yeah. And for the last two or three minutes, it was just carnival atmosphere. When the whistle went, 
the Sunday game I, I, I watched it there recently. The Sunday game did a piece on the on the on the fanfare of it and whatnot, and just the people coming in, just like old people you'd see walking down the street, like as old as my parents, like in their fifties and sixties, like tears coming down their eyes. You know, it was unbelievable. And if you could, you know, you could you, you'd love to bottle that emotion and that feeling. You know, you, it's so hard to explain. And look at while. I know that provincial titles might get a bit of a bad rep and provincials and, you know, the way the results are going in some provinces and whatnot. But for us, as a young team, to get over the line against either one of the big two in, in, in our province was unbelievable. And, yeah, it was just, it was really a watershed moment for our team, I think, because up to that, we didn't really have an identity of, you know, where we coming or going, where we going to have a stab at maybe getting to a kind of final, where we're going to even win a kind of final. You know, we, we were doing okay in the league and then we were kind of coming up short in the championship. So I think that performance and the way it panned out and the way, you know, we won it out with with a couple of points to spare, I think it showed a lot of maturity for the um, inexperience of the squad. And yeah, it's it's unbelievable. I, I can still just remember, like I'm thinking about, I'm talking about, I'm smiling when I'm talking to you here. Like it's just, it was unbelievable. And um yeah, I just I, I didn't want to come off the pitch that day. I just wanted to bask in the glory because it, it, there's no other word for it. It was just absolute glory to be involved with. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So, so we were talking off air, Dodie, about Kevin McStay and the impact that he had on you in 2017 and the year years after that as well. Like we see, he's working the Sunday game at the minute. He's a very driven, passionate man. But yeah, Dodie, no better man to lead the charge that year. Oh no, in fairness to Kevin, like he just got everything off to a tee. And you have to remember as well in the league that year as well, John, like we, we had a we had took a lot of bad, bad beatings in the league. We were in division one that year, if you recall, and you know, like things were things weren't great, I suppose. If you're looking in, you might think Jesus was coming on here. But uh, I don't want to annoy you, but the final game of the league, we actually beat Cavan. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I don't want to rub it in, but we did beat Cavan. And yeah. we hadn't won a game of the league all year. And it was like, oh, Jesus, are we going to go you know, win this all year? <laughs> <laughs> but we, we got a win, and it was a, a huge feeling of relief. And for some reason, we had, I think we were the last team in the country to play a championship. So we looked like a crazy eight or nine week break eight or nine week break until until we played Leitrim, right? So we went back to our club champ. We remember the clo- April club club month. Mm-hmm. We went back. We went back to their championships the whole lot and everyone was in good form. And then we went back, I think it was four or five weeks for championship and we trained hard. Tr- maybe saying we trained hard is an understatement. Now he, we were absolutely dogged. I just, I, I never forget it because we, sometimes we did a bit of training up in Dublin and we were running in DCU up in the, uh, Glass Nevin, I'll never forget it. It was just awful stuff. But it was great, you know, we were all doing it together and nobody passed an eyelid and you know everyone was happy to do it. And um you know, in terms of Kevin, like Kevin is just, you know, he's just unbelievable in terms of he knows exactly what to say at the right time. You know, he might know to come up to you and say, you know, you're you're moving well or you're doing things X, Y, and Z. And just in terms of the dress room as well, he's so good at reading the dress room. Like off air I t- I spoke to you about the night before the kind of final, we had a, a meeting in the Abbey Hotel in Roscommon Town before um, before we headed to bed that night. And don't ask me what he said, but I just remember thinking at the time, and it was kind of universal around the squad as well, that, my God, there's no way we're losing tomorrow. There's no way. Just everything he said, he just hit the nail on the head. And, you know, he could, it was just a point where, like, we can't lose. We absolutely can't lose. Now, granted, I would have, I'd never say that story because if we lost, you know, it'd mean nothing. But obviously, because we won, you know, you think of things like that. But he was just unbelievable at knowing how to get the best out of us. And, you know, look, at, we did get to Crow Park a couple of weeks later against Mayo. We did come up short in the replay, essentially. And that was a phenomenal Mayo team that really, if we're being on, honest about it, probably could have or should have won the All-Ireland that year. So I take no shame at that. Probably the manner in which we lost was obviously disappointing. But yeah, look at Kevin was huge for us and he gave so many young lads and uh, so much confidence, myself included, so much confidence thinking that, you know, we can compete with any team when we're on our day. Obviously, he's won it in 2010, so that was a seven-year gap bridge, Donny, and 
just absolute scenes. I suppose after we we experienced something like this in, in Calvin last year, but we it was we left it far too long. But to leave it seven years, only in a province that you know includes Galway and Mayo. It's not too bad because realistically, when you do look at it, Mayo were competing and getting all Ireland finals in them previous years. Galway were really rising, so it wasn't bad going, Tony. Yeah, no, it wasn't. And I suppose if you're looking back to maybe when I went back, started into the panel in 12, 13 or 14, you're always looking at the draw and seeing, are we on the opposite side of Galway and Mayo? And then you're like, OK. But now it's like, you know, obviously, look, at Galway and Mayo have beaten us the last few times, but whoever you get in the kind of championship, you know, you can, you fancy anyone on your day. You can play well enough on your day, you can beat anyone. So I think it was very much back then, until we actually beat either Galway or Mayo, it was very much... If we can avoid them till the final, you know, we, we, we might be able to beat them, you know. So, um, yeah, I think that that was the biggest thing for us, beating the either Galway or Mayo for the first time, because that just gave us the belief then, you know, because we're, we're lucky enough in, in Connacht that I know um, we only have five teams, but it is quite competitive. You know, you can't for definite call who's going to win the Connacht Championship every single year. Um, so winning that in 2017, was definitely something that made us think, yeah, we can we can compete with the likes of Galway and Mayo. Definitely, don't we? Definitely. And I suppose we were talking off air. Just we talked a lot off air. <laughs> <laughs> we did. <laughs> I don't think I said anything controversial. I hope I didn't anyway. <laughs> I thought Willie Parks said I didn't record anything anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but um, obviously, yeah, Dodi AIB came in into the season in the championship in 2017. The videos are all up on YouTube, obviously, and very intense. Uh, the 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 scene, everything, the video, obviously, your trainings and obviously pre-game, and it, it was great stuff. It really, really was. Um, for anyone uh, tuning into this podcast to really get their eyes on it, uh, you obviously had a bit of an emotional story to tell about your um your fa- your family member. You would end it got quite emotional. It was just it was terrific viewing, Dodi. Yeah, it was, and um, to be totally honest with you, when the guys from AIB came in, like it, it wasn't for a publicity stunt, or it wasn't for, oh, look at where where we're scum and we we want to show how great we are. It was based because we needed the we needed the money to run our team. You know, we're we're not a huge county that has massive funds. Now we're looking the last few years we've we've great sponsors, and you know we're blessed to have them. But that was the reason why it happened, and it, it came a point that when the IB guys came in. It wasn't as if they were going around with two big cameras on their shoulders and there was a spotlight on you all the time. It was just a guy with a small camera and his his helper. That was it. And the two the two lads were the same age as all of us on the squad. And they were nearly like mates at the end of it. And so when the lads were going around with the camera in the team meetings or, you know, in the train sessions or pre-game hotel meals or whatever, you didn't even bat an eyelid. You wouldn't even think that they were on the that they were there. I'm sure with the amount of things that were said in the dress room and the crack the lads were having, I'm sure they edited a lot of it out, which, <laughs> which I'm delighted that they did. But no, it was great to have them in. And look, if you're thinking about it as well, I'm, I, I said to you as well before we came on, like last year during the first lockdown, I actually would look back at it again, just the documentary on YouTube. And, you know, it brought an absolute smile to my face because it, it was great. It was great viewing. I'm sure as a Roscommon fan, it was great viewing because obviously we won the championship or we won the kind of title, which was huge. And um, obviously the piece in it about the family as well was great. And um, Kevin was very good like that. He always wanted players to, I suppose, open up about their family and their personal life. So uh, at that time when uh, Ender was being recorded, he was asked to do it. And yeah, I didn't really know it was coming. He didn't. He was just talking about why, you know, there was always a question at the end, why we do it and why do we play? Mm. And he just got a bit upset about it. And sure, look, it was great. It was great viewing. And, you know, it was great that, I suppose, um, people got to see that side because, you know, we're all human. We all face very personal issues in our own lives. And, you know, people do get sick. Obviously, I, I there's no point talking to anyone about the COVID situation because we all have been affected by it. But, you know, stuff like that does happen in our lives. And, what you see on Sunday for 70 minutes isn't the person that you are. That's only a fraction of what you are. So it was great to have that kind of insight of what we were actually like around the dressing room before the game and all things like that. So, yeah, it was a win-win, I thought. And obviously, the kind of title was the cherry on top because it, it gave that bit of a the dramatic thing to it as well, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. Well said, Tony. I suppose. Do you want to be even touch on what Ender was saying? Obviously, like, cause you know, at the end of the day, we all do of life outside of football, and it was well said by you there. It, for whatever you see on seventy minutes, just an inkling, probably, of what is going on in someone's uh, personal life. So, 
Uh, Donny, your family obviously means a lot to you. Oh, geez, yeah. Look, at I, I, I owe everything to them. You know, my mum and dad. You know, they wouldn't. They would go to the ends of the earth for any. <laughs> I suppose any game we've ever had, you know, we always we always laugh and joke at them. Like, cause when the league when the league fixtures come up every year, uh, mom and dad are always hoping for away games so they make a weekend out of it. You know, it's great. You know, they absolutely live for it, and we're lucky to have them because they, there's nothing they wouldn't do. And obviously, uh, you know, the situation with Keen when he was younger, when he was sick, you know, it was a tough time for mom and dad. I was obviously only young at the time. I was 13, 14 at the time, but I remember, you know. They weren't around a lot, which obviously they were in Dublin with Keane, looking after him. And, you know, whatever happened with Keane, like we didn't really know the severity of it. We obviously knew he was sick and things weren't exactly all rosy in the garden, but they were very good to us. They kept us really sheltered at the time. I think I was doing my junior cert and my brother Ronan was doing his leaving cert. So obviously they had to worry about us as well, while it was absolutely no importance at all, us doing them exams, because in light of what they were actually worrying about. So, um, yeah, we're very lucky that... A uh, very tight knit family. Keane's actually our senior manager for our club team as well. So, um, yeah, he's he's doing well, and so are the family. Mum and dad are uh, they're delighted. They're looking forward to getting back to the games as well. Brilliant stuff, Tony. Brilliant stuff. And I suppose, you know, when AIB did come in, obviously that's we we don't really see much of that these days. It was it was great uh, for everyone to view. I think the, obviously the views are skyrocket for that on YouTube. It's, it is really really good view. And so when something like that comes in, I suppose in the middle of championship preparation, Tony. It, did it knock you off course though? I know you did win the Connacht Championship, but um, at any point did you find it a bit uh, intrusive or did you find it all good? No, I, I didn't, to be honest with you, John, because when the, when the lads came in, while they have hours and hours of footage, it wasn't a situation where they were getting in the way or they were, you know, had the camera right in your eye. You know, it was just, they might get a couple of clips. It could be a 30 second clip of a few lads doing a warm up drill for Trin and they're gone, you know. And that was over a period of four or five weeks. And it was like that. And that's what was ultimately shown on the on, on the video itself. And the vi- and the video of maybe giving getting a few lads to have a word at the camera, that was only a minute or two. And it was literally, okay, lads, we'll see you later. You know, they weren't there as if it was a big thing or a big side show like that. But just to touch on it, like, I think, you know, in JA, we're unbelievable for secrecy and we're unbelievable for, you know, how is the team going? And you might yeah. say, oh, we're not going well. We're not doing anything. You know, it was. I thought it was actually really, really cool in, in, in the way that, you know, we, we weren't afraid to show maybe, even if it was a club team, I, I don't know, maybe other county teams might look at it. Like what we do, you know, we're, we're unbelievable in Ireland for secrets. And, you know, you can't tell, you know, if, if Cavan are playing Monaghan, you know, you don't want anything happening or Roscommon are playing Galway or Galway are playing Mill, you know, it's all hush-hush. But I thought it was actually... Nice to get that perspective and for people, especially your supporters, who'd probably, you know, if there was people in Boyle watching it, they obviously know myself and a couple of the lads from Boyle, but people from maybe from other sides of the county that wouldn't know us personally, they get get that and um, had a chance to see what we actually do and see how hard it is to train at that level and to do all the travelling and the commitment. Because at the end of the day, while it's not in any way a burden, from my opinion, it is you're putting your life on hold, you know, and I, I thought it was actually nice for people to see that and for people to see how the way Kevin and the likes of Liam, Liam McHale operate as well. 100%, don't you, 100%. And is there any uncut footage of the night after the Connacht title? <laughs> are we off air here, are we? <laughs> uh, I'm sure there is, but I haven't seen it and I hope I never will. <laughs> brilliant stuff brilliant stuff some lights crack I would well imagine and uh, <laughs> two years later Tony obviously uh, he's won the Connacht in 2019 another serious achievement and I think Connor Cox had the game of his life a carry native Tony so a really really good feeling to tag on another Connacht title in 2019 yeah it was great and I suppose in a, in a way 29 People might see it as a bigger team because we obviously got over Mayo as well in the semi final. And um, to our Scotland supporters, beating Mayo was probably a bigger thing than beating Galway. So I think the fact that we beat Galway and Mayo was probably huge. And, um, you know, it was an unbelievable feeling because, again, we were in Division One, we got relegated, you know. So I keep going back to this Division One thing where we relegated, we've, we've done well. Um, it, it was great because for the two games, we put in consistent performances. You know, we would have been accused, especially maybe in 2017 or years before that, they can't do back-to-back performances. They can't play well, you know. 
They can't, you know, they might play well one week or not well the next week. And the fact that we were able to do that to back up the performance against Mayo and do it against Galway was huge. And you have to remember, I think we were down by five points at one stage in the kind of final. You know, like it wasn't playing sailing and Coxie that day, like he, and even that year, he was unbelievable. You know, anything that he shot, it was going straight over the bar and he came in straight away. There was nothing like, I'm here, lads, I'm from Kerry, I can do what I want. He was very much one of the lads straight away. And that's how we treat him and that's how he wants to be treated. You know, it was great to have him and he's a great teammate to have. Like he's an unbelievable player, but he's an unbelievable fella as well. 100%, 100%. And obviously kind of pushing on after, like obviously in 17, you came, you came across a very favourite Mayo team. 2019, you know, it, it probably is, it's probably hard to, to get uh, on the wagon after like the um, after winning the kind of title because at the end of the day, you probably like to throw Dublin, Kerry, Mayo after all that, don't you? So 2019, do you feel that year you just could have pushed on and tried to get to the latter ends of Northern Ireland? Uh, yeah, I, I think so, yeah. I suppose... The Super 8 was obviously at that stage, Sean, and Super 8 probably doesn't suit a team like ourselves. You know, we're probably better on a one-off, whereas maybe if a Dublin are maybe beaten in the first round of Super 8, they can get themselves ready again and go again, where we probably need a one-game uh, a, a one game knockout there. And look, we were in a very tough group. We had Kerry, or we had Dublin, we had Tyrone, and we had Cork. And the first game was probably going to be the winner, was probably going to come second or third. We had Tyrone in the hide, and... To be honest with you, even looking back at it still, I looked at it a couple of months ago and yeah, it just felt like a missed opportunity. While if you're from a Tyrone perspective, they probably thought it was a comfortable win. And then obviously from our perspective, it's one that maybe we just didn't showcase our full ability. And it's one that's probably, you know, when you think of 2019, we're a funny old race. We, we, We think of our losses much more we do than our wins. You know, coming off the back of 2019, it was a Tyrone game thinking, you know, could have got to a semi-final there, you know, and that's the ultimate aim, I think, for any team trying to push up, trying to push into the top six or top four is trying to get to the semi-final and ultimately we didn't get there, but, um, you know, we, we couldn't have any complaints like Dublin and Tyrone, you know, like, are you going to play any better teams in the country? Probably not. Yeah, realistically, Dodie, that's that's where it's at. And I suppose, obviously, you've uh, represented uh, DCU and you've won uh, two series and titles as well, Dodie, so, Cups galore, medals galore, and obviously college football, a great bit of crack. Yeah, um, it's I, I suppose it was the making of me playing with DCU. I always say it, like, I know the, the kind of medals are unbelievable, but winning the Sears and Cup in 2015 is probably my standout moment just because of the, the camaraderie we had together in DCU. We all played freshers together. We all lived together. We all socialised. We did Work everything hard. together. <laughs> yeah, all stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We studied, we studied for six, seven hours every day together as well in the library. Yeah, uh, I'd say if you ask some of the DCU lads, they probably still don't know where the library is. To be honest, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've no doubt. I've no doubt. Uh, uh, yeah, it was just one of those years. Like if 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 I was to go back to any stage of my career, it would be going back to January, February, and March 2015 because it was just. It was unbelievable. Like even the, the teams we played, we played Jordanstown up in Belfast. And bear in mind, we jo- Jordanstown had a full forward line of Kieran Hughes, Killian O'Connor, and Paddy McBrearty. And they had did Matty Donnelly, did Killian Clark, did Mick Argu, they had Rory Beck. Like you know, I could I could keep going. You know, an unbelievable star to the team. And then we went up to St Mary's, the teaching college in Belfast, the next day. We beat them after extra time and we played in a pitch you wouldn't put under 14s out in. The pitch was absolutely tiny. We beat them after extra time and we beat UCD with a last minute penalty in the semi final. And then we got over the line against UCC, against uh, Paul Ganey and Connor Cox led team as well. So just the way that worked out and the way that team managed to dig out results, oh, I'll never forget it. I often uh, might ring up some of the boys, we just talk about it, just everything that went on. You know, not just on the pitch, but everything, the socialising, you know, the crack we had, it was just unbelievable and very fortunate to go to DCU and very fortunate to be under the, the leadership of someone like Niall Moyna because, you know, the, the, people say, see from the outside that DCU, just players go there because they're getting free, free whatever, they're getting their fees paid for, or they're getting scholarships left, right and centre. But you should have seen the training we did together. There was nobody that missed the training for college, for that college team. And it was, look, I, I've no doubt saying it, we had a very talented team, absolutely 
serious terms, we Colin Begley, Conor Moyna, Jim O'Connor, like great, great top players. But we all put in the work and we, you know, we if I ever meet, meet them on the street, that's all we talk about. Then nights out, the, uh, the great times we had. And yeah, so yeah, DCU was just unbelievable. And it was definitely the making of probably a lot of, not just myself, a lot of inter-county footballers as well, because you learn so much there. You worked hard, played hard, Donnie. And I suppose, obviously, play, <laughs> playing with uh, lads from other counties, obviously Conor Moyna there from Cav and uh, Con Begley from Leash and some some mighty mighty players there, Donny. And I suppose, obviously, DCU have always had an array of talent over the years. So what was it like to kind of play, obviously, with lads from opposite counties and kind of even learn a few things from them? Obviously, the Cav men too. <laughs> learned loads. I learned loads. Uh, no, it, it was great. Um, my, the first the first year I came into the series and panel, it was 2012, and I was just out of fresher. So I was only 18, 19, and we did have a star sort of team. Like I think we had Philly McMahon, Johnny Cooper, Dean Rock, James McCarthy, Michael Murphy, Paul Flynn, and we had Jack Brady as well from Rammer as well. He was excellent that year too. But I was just, you know, I was to be honest with you, I was like a supporter. When I was training with them guys, I was just happy to be there just to see what they were doing. And it was just an unbelievable feeling. Like even the likes of David Kelly from Sligo, he obviously playing the same position that I was playing in. And I played with him, I think it was in a, like a league a league game. It was some league game in September. It was against Maynooth University. And he was himself, myself and himself were inside. And I looked at his movement and it was unbelievable. It was out of this world what he was doing. And it, he wasn't he wasn't kicking points with his left foot from 40 yards, he was just, his movement off the ball and his talk and his communication, it was different level. I'd never experienced anything like that before. And I was kind of standing there with my, my mouth open, like, you know, not playing, I was supporting. But on the pitch, you know, it was just unbelievable to be there and to be in and around that environment with them kind of fellas and to be coached like from fellas like, um, like the likes of Mick Bohan, who's over the Dublin ladies now, like he is probably the best coach I've been under. He is just an unbelievable coach. You know, he, he demands excellence, you know, and, you know, it's a given with him, you know, and it's something that you, you take for granted doing a good fist pass or a good 10-yard, 20-yard kick pass. You know, that them sort of things that have to be on the money that we take for granted all the time. You know, how many times do we see poor fist passing or poor kick passing? Under Mick and in DCU, they were just, they were drilled into us and I'll never forget it. And hopefully when I retire and I go into do a bit of coaching myself, It'll be them kind of things and them, those type of principles that I'd love, love to work on because it was just unbelievable to be involved and to be a part of it, as much as a supporter I was as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Name some unbelievable players there, Donny. And obviously, the fundamentals they are so important to work on within the game. And it's, it's great that Mick Bohan was uh, working and all that. And I suppose the uh, Sigurdsson competition over the years, obviously, you've had UUJ, uh, UUJ uh, DCU, and St Mary's. And to even see St Mary's win it b- uh, back there a couple of years ago, Donny, like, and that obviously wasn't, that was a team of maybe individuals. There's no massive standout players. It is a great competition, Donny. It's an unbelievable competition. Yeah, it is because. It, it, it's very the col- the way the colleges teams play, and I only got to, I didn't realize before I came to college. But when the colleges teams play against you, it's very tribal. You know, you might be play I might be playing the guy from UCD, and he could be from Roscommon, and he could be my best mate. But you know, he is a mortal enemy for sixty minutes. And I know you're you're supposed to treat all individual or opponents like that. But in colleges, it's just so tribal, and it's not that you're brainwashed, but it's nearly you're nearly thinking that. Oh, these boys, you know, they are trying to take what's for, what's ours. You know, it was nearly border on hatred you had for other teams. I think that's what made it so special because when you did win, you were li- literally winning with guys that you were eating breakfast with, that you were sharing an apartment with, that you were just padding around with all week, you know. And the bond from winning it, and I know it's a cliche, you only have a winning is obviously the best feeling in the world but the, the reason why winning is the best feeling in the world is because the bond you make with your teammates after winning and if i, I could be sitting here to you saying that we lost the sixth and cup final i wouldn't even be talking about it or the bond we had but because we won the bond was just unbelievable you know and um it's something that you know that i probably rank the highest my, my, my favorite achievement because of that and because playing in colleges football is just a different brand of football where it's very kind of you're on top of each other it's very claustrophobic it's harsh environments to be playing in but it's the best the absolute mm-hmm. best in the world you you you're, you, um, you grow up in them kind of environments 
And did they be for the video when you the footage from uh, when you just won Sigerson? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> oh, I hope I definitely hope not. Yeah, there's a few lads there I could name here now, but I won't. I won't. I won't. I'll keep it that for again. There'll be a few lads now that could be under a lot of pressure after the after some of the shenanigans and the DCU nights out. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute carnage, don't even know. <laughs> uh, obviously, uh, moving on to your club, Boyle, and uh, your brother, End, obviously representing uh, Roscommon and Boyle. But Boyle, Donny, how much of a club? It's it's a special club out there in Roscommon for you? Oh, geez, yeah, it is, yeah. The club is everything. I don't know, you probably have had numerous county players coming on saying the club is everything, but it is like we're um, just after kicking off the senior championship there last week, and you know. We were lucky enough to win, but winning a game with your club in the championship, you know, you're just absolutely on fire after it. You know, there's there's no there's no explanation for it. And we were lucky enough in 2013 to win the intermediate title with Boyle, and just I still still remember that the few days, the couple of weeks after, like it's just unbelievable. And um, you know, it, it's somewhere it's somewhere where look at I'm living in Dublin now, and I, I'm I'm here settled, but like there'd be no situation where I'd ever transfer up here. It, I'd have to stay and play with Boyle because you know it's just you know all my best friends are still playing there and it's I, I just love it so much and um if we were ever lucky enough to win the biggest prize in Roscommon with the club you know it'd probably it would surpass anything I've ever done on the field off the field anything you know definitely definitely and what's it like to obviously uh, play alongside your brother and the, the uh, slagging the cracks good no doubt Oh, it is, yeah. It's very good, yeah. The the club lads now would be slagging that we only pass to each other, but <laughs> I don't know where they get that from because Ender doesn't pass the ball at all, so I don't need the ball off him. Uh, no, it is great. You know, obviously we've been playing together for since we were under sevens, under eights, and yeah, it's great to have him playing. Obviously, he was with me in DCU. We've been together in Roscommon, and now obviously we've been with Boyle for the last 10 or whichever years, but uh, you know, he's great to play with. He's um, Obviously, he knows my game inside out, Obviously, I know his, so yeah, we know each other's um, weaknesses and we know our strengths. So it's good to have him there, and yeah, he's in good form and he's in he's in good shape as well. And uh, he's no doubt looking forward to the next year and uh, progressing off of the Roscommon senior footballers. And I suppose uh, to wrap up uh, so far, Johnny, who would be the toughest player you played against and the best player you played with? <sighs> nice easy. Oh, an easy <laughs> one. I'd say the hardest man I've played against probably Mick Fitzsimons. And I know um, everybody knows how good he is, but uh, he's just so good and so far that he, he's like there's nothing mean about him. You know, he's a lovely fella, but he's just so hard to mark. He's always on top of you. You know, you can just nearly feel him breathing down your neck. And when you when you're lucky enough to get the ball on him and turn him, like trying to get by him is so difficult. He's such a good tackler, so technical, always tackles with the ball, and he's just very hard man to get around. So he definitely be up there and. The thing about like him about him as well, there's there's no crap with him, like there's no mouth him with him, there's no dirty tackles, no dirty hits. He's just a total player and someone who is just definitely the best player I've probably ever marked. Um I'd obviously give a couple of honourable mentions, obviously to the likes of Keith Higgins, uh who had Paddy McGrath as well from Donegal. You had a tough time with him a couple of years ago in the league, a very good player too. Uh the best player I'd ever played with, I'd I'd probably I'd have to say um Michael Murphy, I, I, I just can't can't look past him. Um, just from the point of view that everything he did with us with DCU, like obviously he's in the last ten years. I don't think there's anybody been better than him. Without him, Donny Gall having won the three or four or titles or the other, he just, everything he does is just he put he has absolutely no regard for his own body. He's just everything he does is very simple, but yet so effective. He he doesn't miss. He's totally selfless. He tackles harder than anybody. And he runs faster and runs harder than anybody. So he's the ultimate teammate. And also, I'd have to give an honourable mention to my uh, teammate in Roscommon as well, Kieran Murta. Um, he's just an absolute genius to play with. He's again, he's totally selfless, and he's an absolute dream in terms of he plays at eleven and his kick passing and, and his selflessness is just something I couldn't mention either. And he also texted me before to say to say his name as well. So I've no choice but to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, you were coming, lads, huh? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> and uh, the very, very last question, Donny, if there's a young Donny Smith in uh, Roscommon trying to make the breakthrough, what advice would you give a young fella to trying to make the breakthrough onto the county panel? I would say the first thing is to 
Nick Shore and come in to a setup or try and make the breakthrough is just keep practicing on your skills. I know it's skills is very important, but coming into a senior setup and not being able to do the basics of kick with both feet, hand pass, shoot with both feet, you know, you don't really have a lot of business coming in. Um, for me, when I was coming in, I probably came in, looking back on it now, and it's easy to say this now, John, 10 years later, I probably came in too quick, as in I came straight in after the minors. I was in no physical condition to be anywhere near a senior team because I was just too small, and that was just the way it is. Um, so I definitely, I definitely say, look after yourself physically, try and get in as best shape as you can. You don't have to blow up and do all the beach muscles, weights that a lot of players love doing. Just get yourself in good physical condition that you can take a hit, but most importantly, get your skills right. Get your skills right. Uh, so yeah, that'd be the best um, piece of advice I could give to any young fella. Super, Tony, super. Tony Smith, thanks a million for joining me in the podcast this week. And of course, this podcast is sponsored by orgoretro.com and the tax board. Use my promo code JMAC podcast to get 15% off from the orgoretro.com and get the best skins, gloves, and equipment on attack.ie. Be attack minded. Tony, you're a gent. Have a few beers in that sun. John, <laughs> thanks very much for having me. Gentlemen, Cheers. thanks very much. Cheers, sir.